if in your uh, community setting you're going to have a 12 step as part of part of the sort of the day you're having you know you can rent the space to a fellowship but just be careful not to advertise it as if it's you that's doing it and leave the fellowship to manage the room you can you can rent them a space we've done this in the past way back when we set them up we had drop-ins where we had many different things going on and we rented uh, a, a room to a 12-step fellowship and that was it they just paid for the rent of the room and they advertised it in their worthy things and we kept it half of our uh, literature uh, and that kept sort of the relationship okay and uh, another thing was we made sure that none of the we had a wee bit of difficulty with the volunteers who were in the visible community get muddled into getting into the 12 step meeting and that was something that we had to look at because that caused a bit of confusion as to who was re who represented the fellowship was it the visible recovery community or was it the, the particular fellowship? So there's wee things you can do is just make sure that the group members that run the fellowship meeting are separate for the volunteers that are running the community drop-in. Because I'm a 12-stepper myself, I'm very respectful of um, the the whole issue around affiliation or, or anonymity. Uh, one of our venues, uh, we are uh, have a room available for a fellowship meeting to run from. Uh, still autonomous, they, they pay their rent for that. Um, and the, the other way that we can do that is by uh, using a venue, the other way around. So we're using a venue where uh, a fellowship meeting might already be taking place. So my advice if you're trying to connect with 12-step groups is firstly respect the tradition. The 12 step groups have been around in Scotland for 60 years. They've been um, donating freely their time and their energy to help hundreds of thousands of people recover from a range of addictions in Scotland, all for the love of it. And they have a lot in common with the visible recovery communities. We all want the same thing. We all want people in, in Scotland to get better. So. In terms of respecting the traditions, just re recognising that all paths of recovery are to be respected in this recovery movement and that we enjoy the diversity of our recovery paths and we don't fight it. Partnership's important, of course, but ownership really, really important for three things. Accessibility. If the recovery community owns the accessibility of their own community rather than it being part of a treatment system, that means that anyone can come and join the recovery community. In that, you don't have to go through the treatment system to be a member of the community. Anyone can, can come through it. So you, they own the pathway, as it were. So that's the accessibility issue. Sustainability is about um, not being at risk of the system uh, and the money that may not or may or may not be in that system. So it could either be cuts to the ADP that would affect the recovery community or it might be that the recovery community is very much attached to a particular treatment service and that treatment service might lose its contract or something. And so actually owning our own recovery communities and being in control of that means that we're not susceptible to other things going wrong that would affect us. And the last thing really is about the ownership of what we do. Um, if we have our own constitutions, we have our own aims, we have our own objectives, um, then we can start to go around. We don't have to be reliant on that system, the ADP system or, or treatment even, but the wider community is interested in us and we can go and work with them. We can, even, you know, that ownership lets us grow our partnerships really, we can start to pick and choose what we want to be. I sit on the ADP Strategic um, Planning Committee and represent the North East communities in, in that capacity. I think it's dead important that they've got lived experience at the table because you bring that kind of unique point to the table and they can't get that anywhere else. Also, it gives you um, a good footing to hear about what's going on because ideally what we're all there for is to help people get better and help people to recover. And we're part of that journey. As recovery communities, we're part of that. Um, but what I would say is if you're going to go and be involved at the ADP strategic level is about staying true to yourself, 
being there for the reason you're there, being a lived experience, being a representative of your recovery community. Don't get involved in the funding fights or the contentions around services because that's their issues, it's not our issues. And as long as we focus on the recovery and our lived experience, then we'll not go far wrong. Interbolm, which is a small village outside, uh, yeah, they've got a recovery group that started up in there and some of the people in that group uh, came to us and said they'd like to do something big to show people that uh, the village is starting to recover. So the group came together with us and we applied for some money right, and we held a fund day up there which was held, organised by local people who go to the group and we had over 500 people come along to that event today. Some of the people weren't in recovery but it gave these people with the village that there is hope that people with the right support can and will recover. And the village has been on, and so has the, the people that's in that group, been on for strength to strength. One of our recovery cafes is held in the Ratwalk in Stirling, and we have our Recovery Olympics in there once a year. It's a big event. We had 160 maybe attended last year. A lot of the community came over with their kids, got involved in the bouncy castles, face painting, etc. And that's really breaking down the stigma in that local community and getting the community involved. We also, uh, participate in active Stirling stuff where the community members go out hill walking, they go out canoeing. Like Tuesday there we had 10 of our members out canoeing with active Stirling. And that's getting really connected with the wider community. Uh, and we're doing loads and loads of stuff in the, the, our community but I'd be here a lot, long time talking about it but it's basically about breaking stigma and making recovery visible through and forth valley. Connecting with the wider community is important, as important for the national uh, recovery Scotland, uh, in Scotland as it is for local. Um, it's the way that we make ourselves visible and the way that people make social contact with people in recovery. Uh, a few years ago um, the SRC got involved in a ULAB community which is a global change makers community. So it's a, an online and offline community of people who want to change things in the world and we thought it was a great fit for us so we took the course and in the course of that, they were really fascinated by the recovery movement in Scotland and made a short film about us. And were really interested in our values, were interested in our, our, the way that we do our activism. They were interested in the recovery walk. It was just, it really was a good fit between those, the sort of compassionate, rebellious communities and um, the recovery movement in Scotland. And so on that first course, they took the film about our work, about the recovery movement in Scotland, and showed it to everybody in the global community. So about, we think about 36,000 people, including China, all over the world, know, know, now know something about uh, the recovery movement in Scotland. And that is amazing. Kuladarni asked if I would like to become involved in the recovery walk in Dundee and I didn't know how useful I could be but by chance one day I met a local councillor in the street and I was telling him about the walk and he suggested I get in touch with our local MSP Shona Robison who was the Minister for Health. So I got in touch with her and she wanted to become involved and said she would give a, a talk if we wanted so it started there and I thought uh, that was better than I thought it was going to be. So I started to contact other MPs and MSPs and councillors. Uh, the trick, I think, was actually speaking to them all face to face. I actually had went to see them all at their, their surgeries, both the local MSPs and the MPs and the, the leader of the council. And discovered that they all became very interested, largely because they all were aware of the problems of addiction somewhere within their own family. Uh, so that, I think, is quite common probably throughout Scotland. But because I met them face to face, this came out. So eventually, once we firmed up, I kept telling them uh, more about the walk. Uh, as it firmed up when the date was going to be, what the route was going to be, I gave them more information, so I kept on e emailing them every month. As I say, I think it was a personal contact that kept them going. And the day of the walk, we actually had the, the Lord Provis come along. We managed to get a civic reception because I'd gone to see the Lord Provis. And uh, the, both MSPs, both MPs and half the local council, including the leader of the council, all came along and joined us in the walk.
A couple of years ago, we at the Scottish Recovery Consortium got invited to go to uh, the Scottish Parliament um, to speak to all the MSPs about recovery. Um, and we started off by gently sending them over, the, over the month before we went. Once a week, we sent them little nuggets of information about recovery because our intuition was they knew a lot about addiction but didn't really know about recovery. So we sent them little cheeky questions, we called it, uh, which were facts about recovery. And the response was quite interesting. They were surprised, you know, because the, the narrative they hear is people get addicted and they die or they go to a rehab or they, in fact, they don't really know what happens. They just know people get addicted, you know, and they never hear the story about people recovering. And so that's what we went. So we went in, we did the little cheeky questions. And then for three days, we went into parliament and we were, you know, loads and loads of MSPs were coming up to us going, this is good. You know, this is good. We, why don't you, why don't we hear about this more? So it's a story that they hadn't heard. And it's a story that we had to start telling. And we told it really well. We had lots of nice visuals. We had lots of lived experience there. And they were just fascinated to hear the, the facts that people, and in fact, Scotland as a country, is like a world leader, you know, in recovery, basically. We've got lots of stuff happening that they'd never heard of before. And that was just mind blowing for some of them. So we just need to continue that work. The media can be a great way of connecting with the wider community but there's a few points that you need to be aware of when you're going to be talking to the media. First point is the reporter that you're talking to, no matter how understanding they seem to be, they're not the ones writing the story. So be prepared for your story to come back slightly different than what you remember telling the reporter. Also, newspapers are there to sell stories. They're not there to necessarily give across the news. They look for their own agenda, they want to have a wee swing on things. They like to focus negatively on addiction because we know that negativity sells papers. Make recovery the agenda. That's the thing that's going to sell the papers. Another point is be aware of your own boundaries. Don't tell them anything that, that you're not comfortable with. Make sure that you're okay. We want to promote recovery and the media would be a good way to do that, but we've got to be cautious when we speak to the media because there was an incident no too long ago about the Auchincroft project in South Ayrshire where the, the media had written up an article on that and they'd said it was the village of the addicts. And there's a lot more to that than the village of the addicts, to be honest. Um, what happened was the trustees eventually got a hold of the, the, the media and they had asked them to come to the project and have a look around and ask some questions to find out a wee bit more about what Oak and Crew was. Um, and eventually they had managed to get a much more positive um, heading in the paper in an article, um, which was gardening is now blooming. Um, there was a couple of other good things in there, which was in a, a much bigger column as well, which is really good because we don't want negative media to stigmatise people in recovery. Be very clear on the, what impact or why your reasoning behind getting involved in any kind of press campaign, looking for the, the positive message that your recovery community or recovery group is going to benefit from it. Make sure what your motives are. Uh, be absolutely clear on what you want to say and what you don't want to say before you go, uh, before you speak to the press. My experience is that even though you're told that things are off the record, then very few things are ever actually off the record. So be very, very careful about you say, no matter how friendly any reporter uh, may be to you, uh, that my experience is that nothing is, is ever off the record. Uh, and make that, that difference between recovery and addiction, make sure they focus on the positive recovery story rather than the negative addiction default setting that a lot of the press seem to go to.